25 year old primary gravid lady wanted to go for a party with her husband but husband refuses and advises to take rest as she was rh negative it might not be good for the baby's well being After a couple of weeks the patient started to notice decreased fetal movements in contrast to previous days. After 2 days of observing the patient along with her husband went to the emergency department to report the complaint and gives the history of decreased fetal movements since 2 days. The patient reports to the doctor that her blood group is O negative. The doctor checks the patient's old reports and finds a normal ultrasound scan at 12 weeks and 19 weeks and found that she is 27 weeks gestation at present. On examining the patient, the doctor notices that her fundal height is not corresponding to the gestational age. The doctor checks for fetal heartbeat, but the fetal Doppler shows no fetal heartbeat. This patient, who is 27 weeks primary gravida, came with complaints of decreased fetal movement for two days, has Rh negative history. On examination, fundal height has reduced. Fetal Doppler shows no fetal heartbeat as well. Taking all this into account, this is mostly a case of intrauterine fetal demise. So, how do you confirm the diagnosis? A. Blood antibody screen. B. Coagulation profile. C. Fetal cake counts. D. Non-stress test. E. Transabdominal ultrasound. From the given scenario presented to you, you have a 25-year-old who at 27 weeks of pregnant with an Rh negative pregnancy. presents to you with absent fetal movements for 2 days on clinical examination you are not able to pick up the fetal heart sound and the parabdomen findings are lesser than the given gestational age so how would you confirm your diagnosis an ultrasound as you have understood from our scenario here we are talking about intrauterine fetal death the who defines intrauterine fetal death as death prior to the complete extraction or expulsion of products of conception from the mother irrespective of the period of gestation or viability and it is not an induced termination of pregnancy this has been further redefined to add the points that the pregnancy should be beyond 20 weeks or at least the fetus should weigh more than 500 grams why this 20 week cut off was added is because a termination or an expulsion of pregnancy before 20 weeks is called a miscarriage an intrauterine fetal death is further reclassified into two categories either early or late depending on the gestational age at which the death has happened early being between 20 to 27 weeks and late fetal death beyond 27 weeks the other classification is a macerated or a fresh stillborn a macerated stillborn means that the death has happened much before the delivery process and that's why the fetus has undergone autolytic decomposition however a fresh stillborn means the time of death and birth is very close so now that we have classified and defined intrauterine fetal death let's talk about the different causes that may be there as always most of the causes can be categorized as maternal fetal placental or unexplained sadly for fetal demise most of the causes are unexplained approximately 25 to 40% were ranging up to 60% depending on which book you like to follow most of the causes cannot be found and are labeled as unexplained in this category the next most common cause is fetal around 25 to 40% of fetal death is because of fetal problems could be a congenital abnormality could be a chromosomal abnormality could be a growth discrepancy could be any infection the next most common is placental placental contributes to 20 to 30% it could be because of improper placentation or placental dysfunction or lastly an acute issue such as placental abruption and the least most common cause for intrauterine fetal death is maternal it is 5 to 10% and maternal causes could be extremes of age mainly elderly beyond 42 years of age obesity maternal medical problems such as diabetes hypertension or maternal autoimmune problems such as sle or apla so now that we've understood the various causes for intrauterine fetal demise how would you confirm your diagnosis your diagnosis would be confirmed based on first the clinical presentation 
the lady would present to you with complaints of decreased or absent fetal movement for a given duration. On clinical examination, you may find that the fetus is smaller than the given gestational age or may be appropriate, depending on how long ago the death may have happened. The farther, the longer ago the death has happened, the smaller the fetus would be because the growth has stopped for a longer time. If the death has happened recently, you may not really notice much discrepancy in growth size. Lastly, you would not be able to auscultate any fetal heart sound with your stethoscope, Doppler or the Pinard scope. So how would you confirm your diagnosis? The only way to confirm your diagnosis is to do a real-time ultrasonography. While performing the ultrasound, there are certain signs that are suggestive of an intrauterine demise. The first most common sign is obvious, which is an absent fetal heart. Not being able to visualize fetal cardiac pulsations is the definition of fetal demise on ultrasound. The other markers that you may look for can point out to how long ago the demise has happened. So you have named signs such as Robert's sign, which means intrafetal gas, which, is, which indicates that the fetal death has happened in the last 12 hours. Helix sign, which means having gas within the umbilical vessel. So it looks like a helix. Hyperflexion sign or bagel sign because of hyperflexion of the fetal spine because of maceration. And lastly, you have the spalding sign, which happens approximately seven days after fetal death. It's because of collapse of the fetal skull bones. You may also notice high drops. You may also notice that the biometry is small. You may notice reduce in Lyca volume. You may notice other placental issues. So now we've got a diagnosis of intrauterine fetal demise. How do we break the bad news to the family? Breaking the bad news is an essential step. Before we discuss the diagnosis with the patient and her family, you should ensure that she has a support system in place, that she has privacy to listen and react to your issues, and that they have ample time to discuss their options. The points that you need to cover while breaking the bad news is the cause or the diagnosis. What can be done next, whether you want to go for expectant management or you want to induce a termination? When would you plan this? What all investigations would be required? What would you do after the delivery has happened? And most importantly, what would you do before the next pregnancy? So we'll cover each one of these points. The first point is the cause. As we've already discussed, most of the causes are unexplained. However, we will still investigate the mother, the pregnancy and the fetus to look for other probable causes for the death in this pregnancy because we are trying to ascertain why it has happened, what is the likelihood that it can recur, and if there is any intervention that can be done to prevent its recurrence in the next pregnancy. Now when we move on to management of uh, intrauterine fetal demise, you have two options to offer the lady. She can choose expectant management or she can choose an immediate termination. Expectant management means the lady would wait for spontaneous onset of labor pains to deliver the dead fetus. Expectant management has a good success rate where approximately 80% of women will deliver before four weeks. However, what you must emphasize is that there is a complication associated with intrauterine fetal demise which is called DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation in the mother. It is because of fetal thromboplastin and placental tissue that will embolize into the mother's system and will cause DIC. The risk of DIC to the mother is only 10% in the first four weeks. However, beyond four weeks, the risk becomes 30%. So if someone is choosing expectant management, ensure that they are aware of this complication, that they're willing to come back for checkup, they're willing to get tested twice a week during the expectant management period. And if they cross the four week cutoff, you must insist on going for induction of labor rather than further expectant management. If the patient is willing for induction of labor, you can offer her various methods. It could be mechanical or medical. Before going into the depths of induction, I would like to point out the benefits of induction of labor is that it cuts down the delivery interval. Usually the induction to delivery interval is around less than 24 hours. 90% of them are successful. So let's move back to the types of induction. You could have mechanical induction. 
In mechanical induction, a Foley catheter is inserted into the cervix and inflated to dilate the cervical canal. In medical methods, you use drugs to prepare the cervix and to initiate labor contractions. So the drugs that could be used could be mifepristone, misoprostol, and even rarely prostaglandin E2. Mifepristone is an anti-progesterone drug. So it is given in the dose of 200 milligrams, after which 48 hours later, we would start with the other drugs. Mifepristone has been known to speed up the induction to delivery interval. The next drug is misoprostol. Misoprostol is the most recommended drug for induction of labor in intrauterine fetal demise. It is preferred to PGE2. Misoprostol dosage is specific for the gestational age. Less than 26 weeks of pregnancy, you would give 100 microgram, 6th hourly throughout the day. You may give up to maximum of 800 micrograms a day. Beyond 26 weeks of pregnancy, we would reduce the dosage to 50 microgram, 4th hourly, to a max of 600 micrograms a day. If the lady has had a previous scar, like a single previous caesarean or previous two caesareans, there is a risk of induction of labor. So we would reduce the dose of misoprostol respectively to 50 or 25 and explain to the patient that even though the risk is small, induction of labor has still been proven of benefit. So now that the delivery is over, we now move on to postnatal management. Now before we progress with the delivery, we would have already discussed with the patient and her family on what their options are for postnatal management. The management basically tries to delineate the cause for the intrauterine fetal demise. So it would involve examining the fetus and examining the placenta. The level to which we may examine will be dependent on the patient and their family's preference. We may offer an autopsy of the fetus to ascertain the exact cause and this autopsy would be done by a perinatal pathologist. However, due to certain social and religious constraints, not everybody is open to the idea of autopsy. So then you may offer them other options. You may have biopsies taken from the fetus for genetic testing. The placenta may be sent for genetic evaluation. The baby, rather than having an autopsy, we may take an MRI so as to get a soft tissue diagnosis of any internal pathology. A full body X-ray is taken and blood samples are withdrawn, which are then sent for further genetic testing. So if a patient would rather prefer this option versus autopsy, then our insistence on immediate termination of pregnancy becomes important. You may wonder why I would say something like this. Now, once the death has happened in utero, the fetus undergoes degradation or autolysis. Because of the autolysis, the tissue is broken down, the blood is destroyed, and the genetic material is lost. So the longer the interval between the death and termination or delivery, the more the damage. So if the patient is already inclined to not have an autopsy or they do not want further evaluation, you may offer them an immediate termination because the genetic material would still be viable and we would still be able to get more information that we may offer to the family. We must ascertain why the death has happened because if we are able to pick up a cause, we may be able to educate the patient on her risks and what can be done in the future pregnancy. Once the fetal evaluation is done, we move on to the mother. The mother needs to have bereavement. She should be allowed to counsel. She should be allowed to accept her loss and acknowledge what has happened to her. She should have areas of discussion open to her on what can be done and what she is feeling and what can be done to cope with it. The next important thing is lactation suppression. Lactation suppression should be offered because if the mother starts to lactate, that itself can push her into postpartum depression. There are drugs such as bromocriptin or cabagolin that may be offered. If the mother is RH negative, then anti-D would have to be given. If we are able to ascertain fetal blood group, then we may give if the fetus is positive alone. If we are not sure or if the autolysis is too severe, an anti-D should still be offered for the benefit rather than the risk of missing an isoimmunization. And lastly, once we discharge the mother, we must give her contraceptive advice so that she may at least plan her future pregnancy after all the information as to the cause in this pregnancy has been delivered to her and that once she may be mentally and physically strong enough to then plan her future pregnancy. So now that you've understood the cusp of postnatal management, I would like to just 
discuss on how the investigations of an intrauterine death are conducted. The tests that are done are done for both the mother and the fetus. And the tests are done, one, is to ascertain the mother's current clinical condition and also to look for other causes of fetal death and probably future problems that may arise, similarly for the fetus. So these tests are divided into blood investigations and ultrasound investigations. So with the mother, one of the basic tests we would ask is a CBC. The CBC would let us know if she's having anemia, if her total count is up and she's probably having an, an ongoing infection. If she is having a high hematocrit, that means she's dehydrated, probably an indicator that she may be having preeclampsia. We would do a CRP to look for any infection, infective focus. We would then test her for diabetes. So we would ask for a fasting blood sugar, do an HbA1c because maternal diabetes is a high risk factor for intrauterine fetal demise. We would then look for any other source of maternal infection. So if mother is presenting to you in, with fever, with signs suggestive of choriamnitis, then we would ask for a maternal bacteriology survey, which is blood cultures, vaginal and cervical swabs, urine cultures. If the fetus on ultrasound had shown features suggestive of high drops, we would ask for a maternal torch panel. We would also obviously have a maternal screening done because HIV, HBSAG and VDRL can also indicate a cause for maternal fetal death. The next step that we would do is look at the fetus for further evaluation. So the fetus on ultrasound itself would point out if there is any sign of growth restriction, if there's any gross congenital uh, anomaly or deformity, if the fetus is suggestive of high drops, so you're assuming a non-immune or an immune high drops as the cause for fetal death. These would all ascertain these investigations to problems in the current pregnancy. The other more rare causes that could cause an IUD are things such as red cell alloimmunization or APLA syndrome, maternal autoantibodies such as anti-Rho, anti-La. These are rare, but if everything else turns out to be negative and you're not able to ascertain a cause, these also would warrant a further evaluation. So now that I've listed all the investigations that can be done during the antenatal or the immediate postnatal period, if all of our investigations has shown nothing of use, the immediate postnatal evaluation of the dead fetus and placenta has also not pointed out to a cause, then this patient would sadly fall into the unexplained group of IUDs. So what would you do next? The next most important aspect is pre-pregnancy counseling. So before she plans her next pregnancy, you would like to ascertain what would be her risks of recurrence. If there's any medication, she may start early on. So if the mother is obese, you would advise on weight loss. If she already had hypertension, diabetes, you would try to correct them or bring them to the normal ranges pre-pregnancy. If she had, if she was torch positive in the first pregnancy, it doesn't mean it has to recur in the second pregnancy, but you can advise her on how to prevent recurrent exposures. If she has antibodies to certain uh, antigens, such as anti-Rho, anti-La, or she's APLA positive, then medications for that can be initiated early on. If it is a fetal chromosomal problem, then probably pre-implantation genetic diagnosis may be offered because certain balanced translocations in the parents may keep recurring with every pregnancy. So depending on the risk involved, you may discuss such options with the parents. So most important with diagnosing an intrauterine fetal demise is to ascertain the cause to treat the current pregnancy and to prevent this problem from recurring in the future pregnancy. And most important advice I'd like you to take from this talk is that the breaking the bad news is essentially important because when you bring this news to the parents, you must do it with a lot of empathy and be willing to explain the prognosis to them because at that moment, you are the only person there who can make them understand the situation and how to combat it. Thank you.